hello. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, organizers, for picking up my um, CFP proposal for this conference. I've seen that uh, last year's TWF conference edition has had at least two Holland's talks. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is Holland's as well, but I'm going to talk about uh, specific features that makes Holland's a little bit more sophisticated AR device than the others. But let's first let me introduce myself. I'm Rafał Legenc. I work for a consultancy company called Solid Brain in Krakow, and I'm focused mainly on HoloLens actually at the moment. Mm -hmm. What I do is I explore uh, business possibilities with holographic technology. I do lectures at different conferences and meet meetups, and I also conduct workshops. So if you're interested to have a workshop at your company, for example, or at your user group, just contact me and we can talk. What the other thing I'm involved with is the conference I'm doing with my friends in Krakow uh, for the last seven years. It used to be called Dev Day, it's now DevConf, and it happened to be last week in Krakow. Okay, so HoloLens. How many of you already heard about the device? That's what I thought. The HoloLens is, well, to do a quick recap, it's a very sophisticated AR device that you basically put up on your head and turn, fire up the application and all of a sudden you have all this magic happening around you. You have all the holograms laying on the floor, hanging on the wall, they interact with each other, they also interact with real world surfaces, walls and uh, sofas and tables, etc. So, this device isn't new, isn't that very new. It was, I think it was introduced in late 2015 and first developers got their devices, I think it was June 2016. So it's a bit more than a year that the device is on the market actually. So what changed since then, right? We can clearly see what is going on in the App Store because we can see that there are hundreds of applications already there, which are, some of them are really cool. There are a lot of games, there are already a lot of educational applications. But what's more interesting, from my perspective at least, is that there, there are a lot of business opportunities that are out there. There are a lot of companies that actually picked up the subject and they started providing real business applications with HoloLens to different businesses uh, that solves their problems, right? In example, earlier this week, I was in, um, in Warsaw for uh, IT Future Expo, and I had a booth with HoloLens, and I had several people from different businesses, companies like Orlen or Henkel and alike, the people who were coming to my booth and they were asking me how holographic technology could uh, help their business. They were saying me things, the problems they have, and I was explaining them how we could work together, for example, to, to, to solve this problem. So this thing is actually happening. Uh, you might have heard some rumors, for example, that um, Microsoft is not going to release the next version anytime soon, or that the vendor who was producing the special processor for HoloLens actually stopped producing that. Uh, and on the other hand, you can see uh, here some positive news uh, or rumors that uh, Microsoft is actually not releasing the new version because of lack of competition, actually or that they started designing a new processor which will have AI module embedded. So we never know what Microsoft will do with that, but we, what we are sure is what Microsoft does officially with it. There is this whole ecosystem that they call mixed reality. HoloLens was the first device in this ecosystem. And what Microsoft is doing is they're re releasing the new headsets, which are going to compete rather with Oculus and HTC Vive. Uh, but they are part of this bigger ecosystem. And they also are pushing the updates to their operating system, Windows 10. The most recent one is called Creators Update. And the, win the Windows, the new updates uh, introduce in Windows new features to, uh, to those immersive headset and headsets and to HoloLens. So 
That's the current state of HoloLens. Uh, let me do a quick recap of the specification. Uh, in HoloLens, at the very front, we have the whole bunch of sensors for environmental cameras that are responsible for gathering data uh, about spatial features around the user. We have RGB camera, we have depth sensor, ambient light sensor, and mixed reality camera capture, and also for microphones. Uh, then we have this pair of special glasses inside which are responsible for displaying the holograms in front of the user's eyes. And then we have the brain, which is uh, HPU, holographic processing unit. This is the special processor. It is actually a coprocessor. It is not the main one. It processes the uh, hold all sensory data. So it gets data from all the sensor I've just mentioned uh, and processes it and then passes it to the main processor. What else? Uh, I've, um, I've uh, said the term mixed reality before. Um, and let me, let me tell you where HoloLens fits in the, something which is called virtuality continuum. Because at the very moment we have a lot of um, devices out there on the market which are somewhere in between. So there is something called virtuality continuum, and this is not a new term. You can Google it up. There is a lot of articles about it. And this virtuality continuum defines different digital realities that we have. So on one end, we have real reality, which is everything that we see and interact every single day with. And on the other end, we have virtual reality, which basically is what you have when you put Oculus on or HTC Vive. You have uh, the user is completely cut off from the real world and he or she only interacts with virtual things. And in between, there is this uh, spectrum called mixed reality. And this contains things like augmented reality and augmented virtuality. Augmented reality is basically, those are devices that extends our real reality, so we are all uh, we are, for example, seeing the reality through, through the smartphone or tablet or the optical see-through glasses, and the, the view we are getting is enhanced with uh, something digital. And there is this other thing, augmented virtuality, which is not very common, but you can Google it up and see uh, what uh, devices are there. But this is basically something that renders virtual world and can bring some real things into that virtual world. So HoloLens is basically somewhere around augmented reality, but it's not, um, it's more sophisticated than AR devices that we can see, for example, what we can see on Android phones, phones or iPhones. Okay, so let's go to, to the actual subject of the, of the talk. HoloLens is, uh, watching all the time. I mean, from the moment when it's turned on, it constantly, invariably scans user surroundings, period. Whether there is an app running or not, it constantly scans the area around the user. Even if I would just turn on the whole lens and put it on the table, it will scan the area. So that's the very important thing, because many developers who were um, getting HoloLens and started working with it, they thought that um, it's a um, responsibility of the developer to actually write some logic to scan the room and location and put it all together. No, it happens on the operation system level. It scans all the time, it brings data to the special area called spaces. That's actually a window from the Windows 10 uh, in HoloLens. So, for example, if I would turn on HoloLens in this location, it, was, it would start scanning this location and it would uh, name it somehow, and it would create a space for it, like this one item here. And it would, everything it would gather here in this location, it would put in that bucket. And it, I, if I would take HoloLens to other locations, for example, to my office, then it would detect that it's in other location and it would create another bucket here and it would save data to that uh, bucket. So user and developer doesn't have to do anything to make this happen, actually. And 
important bit is that we can't access this information. All we can do is we can view how many spaces we have saved in our uh, HoloLens and how much space do they actually take on our hard drive. But for current location where we are in with our HoloLens, what we can do is that we can access a device portal uh, from our computer to HoloLens. Basically, we can connect to HoloLens by putting IP address of HoloLens to our web browser. And there, we can view the 3D model of our current location. We can't view every, uh, every location that is saved on that HoloLens, but we can view the one that, is, that we are currently at, right? So that's very helpful for developers because you can see how much of the location is being scanned and how perfectly it's scanned. And what's more important is that we can export that 3D model. It's, it's actually like a regular model, which we could do, for example, in Blender or 3D Studio Max. We can export it and we can import it in the emulator so that, for example, whenever I am at the office, I can scan the office. And when I'm at home, I can work with the office model at home in the emulator, which is very helpful. OK, so how, how to actually put all those data to use? Because I said that we kind of don't have access to it. I mean, we don't have direct access to it. But that's where Unity Engine's scripting API comes into play. There is this object called Surface Observer that we can use and program. And it basically queries that spaces, space that I've mentioned before. It queries the system for the, for the data to understand what is going on. And when it's working, it throws to developers, to, de to a developer uh, events like surface created or added, surface updated, surface deleted. So the developer is getting events that something is going on in the area where the whole lens is working. Also, that Surface Observer does have something which is called the bounding volume. This is kind of an area in a 3D space uh, that defines from where those updates should come from. So for example, if we are designing an application that requires the user to remain rather stationary than moving, we can create word-locked, box-shaped, a bounding volume around the user, and that would be the place where we would get update of the environment. And in other case would be uh, if the application would require user to walk a lot and look a lot around him or her, then for example, we would have bounding volume which would be body locked to a user and it would be better to have it frustum shape, which would be like mimics the which would mimic the field of view of the user, so that whenever user is walking and looking a lot, it would get updates from places where he or she is looking. And what Surface Observer gives to the developer are actually special surfaces. That's what uh, is it called. And this is nothing else than just regular game objects in Unity. These are regular objects that we that we get in our uh, application and we can apply renderer, collider to it. So basically, for example, for the, for the wall, we would get a special surface which would have a renderer and collider. So whenever we have a virtual object in our application and that virtual object would be hitting the wall, it would hit the collider which would be next to the, wall, the real wall and we would get that effect that the virtual object actually hit the real wall. As a result, we would have something like this. We have like a regular room in our real world and it would be mapped with our uh, special surfaces that were given by Surface Observer to us. And on this picture we can see the virtual surfaces visualized with this nice uh, green grid. But if we would turn uh, of that color, if we would apply the material that would be transparent, we would still have those surfaces there, virtual surfaces there in our program, but it would look like this, right? Then we, we could just put all the holograms and, and game objects into our scene and 
the user will think that, that virtual things are actually sitting on top of real things, right? Um, it's not all sunshine and, and rainbows, of course. There are a lot of problems. Uh, the scanning process is not ideal. It's not perfect. We have a lot of problems, actually, while scanning the, uh, uh, while, while scanning the area we're in. So it, the scanning process can be affected by lightning or how far we are from the objects. So for example, if we, I would have HoloLens on right now and there is this darker area there, I wouldn't be able to scan it really uh, in a really good way. Or if I'm looking at that wall down there, it wouldn't be scanned as well because it's too far, right? So during our, or after our scanning experience, scanning process, we'd probably end up with a lot of holes in our, um, in our uh, scanned location. Also, we would end up with some hallucinations, which are basically existing virtual surfaces with no corresponding real ones. That, that happens, for example, when we have uh, something moving in our area which we scan, for example, a dog or a person who is standing in front of us and we would scan him or her and after the scanning process he or she would disappear but this scanned model of this person would remain. So that would look weird when we would have application and our hologram would hit something invisible in, uh, in the very middle of our scene. And also we would have, we would end up probably with some biases, which means basically some surfaces wouldn't be uh, aligned perfectly with, um, with real surfaces. So for example, the, the floor which would be scanned, the virtual floor would be a little bit more sloppy or bumpy. Uh, so those are the problems. And to overcome those problems, we have, um, we have a whole toolkit for this. Developers have access to uh, the free library which is called Holo Toolkit, which was recently uh, renamed to Mixed Reality Toolkit. So basically we can use a bunch of classes to fill the holes, remove hallucination, or m smooth the meshes that were created. So uh, for example, the floor wouldn't be bumpy. because. One, one simple example is that if we have a real flat floor like this one and we would get a real bumpy or not aligned uh, virtual floor, if we would have a ball rolling on that floor, the virtual ball, it would, it would seem like it's jumping on something invisible. So we have to make sure that the floor is actually flat, the virtual one. Uh, also, for the holes, if you won't get rid if you won't get rid uh, 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 holes, then for example, we would, we, would we would have, for example, a hole in the, in the floor somewhere and one of our virtual objects can just be dropped there and disappear, right? And that would be feel weird for, uh, for a user. Uh, along with common problems, there are also common needs. And those needs are like place kept generation. So imagine that you're creating a game of, or the application uh, that requires you to, um, before the experience starts, it requires to, uh, to render some objects in your play space area. For example, I don't know, you have to render uh, several buildings spread uh, on the floor, right? That's one of the need. Also, mesh smoothing, that's something that I, I mentioned, to, sm to smooth the meshes that were created by uh, Surface Observer. Also, you might want to uh, find some planes. So the common need is to identify which surface is the floor, actually, or which surface is the wall, or where is the table, or the bed, or any other platform which is not floor. Also, we might want to query the surfaces. We might want to query the floor for uh, areas for our game objects. For example, we would like to render several buildings on our floor, so we can, we would like to have a possibility to ask the system, give me four, uh, four areas on the floor which would fit boxes as big as one meter by one meter by one meter, and every box would be two meters away from each other, 
right? So this is kind of a query. We would like to have a possibility to query the system with this, uh, these requirements and would be good to get back some reasons like, okay, so we can place it here, here, and there, right? The same happens with querying, for example, walls. We can query, we, we would like to be able to query the wall to give us square-shaped areas spread uh, on the biggest wall. And that's where special understanding comes into place. We also have components given by Microsoft to do all those things. And we can actually, there is a good example in a game called Fragments on HoloLens. It's basically the game where there's a crime scene and there are people, uh, holographic people coming in and you're interacting with them. And there's a lady that comes into this, this scene, the holographic lady, and she needs a chair to sit on. So developers queried the place, place space area for a platform that isn't the floor, but is somewhere um, higher than the floor, which looks like a chair. And they automatically detect it with those libraries, and then the hologram is programmed to go to that place and sit on that table. And I don't know if you played that game, maybe you can try, uh, because I've seen the stand with holes there. It, the, the effect is amazing and stunning. That would be pretty much it. My references that I, I'm based, I based my talk on is my blog post that I did on spatial mapping, the spatial mapping uh, documentation from Microsoft and Unity Engine Surface Observer. So if you want those links, just ping me and I can send presentation or those links directly to you. Thank you. <laughs>